Hello, hello, hello. I'm so happy to see you again. <laughs> You've joined me at the beginning of another unit. I think you're seeing how easy it is to learn everything when you encounter it in an orderly manner, aren't you? So, we just finished a unit on endometrial uterine cancer. That's this, my version of it. Now, of course, endometrial uterine cancer involves only this portion of your uterus, when in fact, your total uterus consists of both your uterus and your cervix. So I think it's only proper to address cervical cancer also. You see, I don't want you to confuse endometrial uterine cancer with cervical cancer because they are two very different diseases. Actually, they are so different that I don't even mention cervical cancer in my book. Not the first edition nor the second edition. Why not? Well, because it's not a disease of menopausal women. But I want to take this opportunity to explain just how different cervical and endometrial uterine cancer are. And since I think you need to understand both of them, I'm going to go ahead and give you a little unit on cervical cancer here in these videos. So why should you watch a video on cervical cancer when it isn't even a disease of menopausal women? Because I said so. <laughs> no, it's because the differences between endometrial uterine cancer and cervical cancer are profound. So my goal with this video is to compare and contrast the big picture of endometrial uterine cancer with the big picture of cervical cancer. I'm not going to go into any detail today on cervical cancer. I'm going to save that for the videos that follow this one. I just want you to understand and have an overall mental picture of how these two cancers that are located so close to one another physically are so drastically different clinically. So let's start by listing all the pertinent characteristics of endometrial uterine cancer that you learned in the last unit. And as we go along, we'll contrast and compare them to cervical cancer. And of course, we'll make a chart. <laughs> You discovered that endometrial uterine cancer is the most common gynecologic cancer among postmenopausal women. So how does that compare with the incidence of cervical cancer? Well, historically, cervical cancer was much more common than endometrial uterine cancer, the story of which I'll tell you in a later video. But now, it's the second most common gynecologic cancer because endometrial uterine cancer is number one. Cervical cancer varies in incidence depending on things that I'll be explaining to you in later videos. So, let's just start our chart by designating the differences in the incidence between endometrial uterine cancer and cervical cancer. Okay, so now we come to risk factors. These are the things that put you at risk for the disease. The more risk factors you have, the higher your risk for that disease. Well, with regard to risk factors for endometrial uterine cancer, you learned that there are only three. Old age, being fat, and excess or unopposed estrogen. It's very, very straightforward. But with cervical cancer, the risk factors are completely different. And in some cases, completely opposite. Cervical cancer is like most other cancers in that it has a much longer list of risk factors. The risk factors for cervical cancer include all the following. Young age. Young age at first intercourse. More than one sexual partner many pregnancies, cigarette smoking, chronic immune suppression, DES exposure, with DES being diethylstilbestrol, infrequent pap smears, history of an abnormal pap smear, or living in an underdeveloped country. Now, 
These differences in the risk factors is what I find most interesting between endometrial uterine cancer and cervical cancer. Notice that three of the risk factors for cervical cancer have to do with sexual history. And the kind of sexual history that is most commonly associated with cervical cancer is a somewhat promiscuous sexual history. Endometrial uterine cancer occurs in women who are old and fat and therefore probably not very promiscuous. But instead of being old and fat, like the typical endometrial uterine cancer patient, cervical cancer patients are more likely to be young and sexy. That's just a boiled down difference in the prototypes for the two cancers. So let's add this to our chart, but we're going to do so in two separate ways. We're going to put one line first for the overall prototype of the kind of woman who gets the cancer, and then another line for the specific risk factors. Now let's address the type of cell that transforms from a normal cell into a cancer cell. For endometrial uterine cancer, the cell type that causes it is a columnar glandular cell, also called an adenomatous cell. And I used this to demonstrate that in the uterine cancer videos. It is a cell that responds to estrogen and progesterone. For cervical cancer, it's a completely different story and a completely different cell. Instead of a columnar glandular cell becoming cancerous, with cervical cancer, the typical cell is a squamous skin cell. Have you ever heard of squamous cell skin cancer? A squamous cell is a skin cell. You have them in many parts of your body other than the skin you see on the outside of your body. Squamous cells are hardy cells that can withstand insults from the environment, unlike the adenomous adenomatous cells of uterine cancer. And your cervix gets insulted with all sorts of things that require it to be hardy. So the cell type that becomes cancerous in cervical cancer is most commonly a squamous cell. And please know that both endometrial uterine cancer and cervical cancer can stem from many other types of cells too, but I'm just giving you the most common ones that comprise the vast, vast majority of cancers. So let's add this to our chart. Next is the cause of the cancer. In the last unit, you learned that the sole cause of endometrial uterine cancer is estrogen. It's that straightforward. And interestingly, there is a straightforward cause of cervical cancer too. And it fits well with the list of risk factors and the prototype of a young, sexy woman. It's the human papilloma virus, which goes by the acronym HPV. HPV causes 99% of cervical cancers. So both of these cancers have one obvious cause. And here it is on our chart. Next, we have the pathological process. In other words, what phases does the disease progress through in order to become cancer? For endometrial uterine cancer, you saw that the pathological process is progressive from normal cells to hyperplasia to atypical hyperplasia to dysplasia, and then to neoplasia. Well, guess what? It's exactly the same for cervical cancer. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> so here's our chart again. Next comes mode of spread. This refers to whether the cancer tends to spread by local invasion of nearby structures or via your lymph system or via your bloodstream. And you know from the last unit that endometrial uterine cancer spreads by local invasion of nearby structures. Well, the same is true for cervical cancer. So on this parameter, once again, they're similar. And here it is on our chart. 
Now for grading and staging. This is the designation of how far the cancer has spread. For purposes of our comparison today, I'm just going to use the simplified system with Roman numerals only and leave out all the subcategories. For endometrial uterine cancer, you learn that the basic staging is as follows. Stage one is the uterus only. Stage two is the uterus and cervix. Stage three is the pelvis only. And stage four is beyond the pelvis. For cervical cancer, it's a bit different and it goes like this. Stage one is cervix. Stage two is the uterus. Stage three is the vagina. And stage four is beyond the pelvis. So let's add all of that to our chart. Treatment is next. And of course, treatment depends on stage. And for endometrial uterine cancer, you discover that treatment is primarily surgical with radiation or chemotherapy added only for the really distant spread. But the treatment for cervical cancer is quite the opposite. Instead of surgery being the most common treatment modality for most stages, it's radiation therapy. So while the earliest stage of cervical cancer may be treated and cured with surgery, radiation therapy is utilized thereafter. Of course, it's not uncommon to use more than one kind of treatment with both endometrial uterine cancer and cervical cancer. But the big difference is that surgery is the primary treatment for endometrial uterine cancer, whereas radiation therapy is the primary treatment for cervical cancer. So let's put that on our chart. And our last area of comparison is prognosis. You learned in the previous unit that the five-year survival rates for endometrial uterine cancer by stage are as follows. Stage one, it's 97%. For stage two, it's 75%. For stage three, it's about 55%. And for stage four, it's about 16%. For cervical cancer, it's a different story. Despite all the progress that has been made with very early diagnosis of cervical pre-cancer and cervical cancer, it is still the number one cause of mortality from gynecologic cancers. So while the prognosis for endometrial uterine cancer is quite good, this is not the case with cervical cancer. Here are the five-year survival rates for cervical cancer by stage. Stage one is about 90%. Stage two is about 60%. Stage three is about 30%, and stage four is about 15%. So survival decreases by a third or more for each and every stage. So now we can complete our chart. When you look at the completed chart, you see that of 10 parameters, only two are similar between endometrial uterine cancer and cervical cancer. They are the pathological process and the mode of spread. Other than those two factors, these two cancers are as different as two cancers in completely different parts of your body. The fact that these two anatomic parts are located so close together and are actually part of the very same organ doesn't serve to make them similar with regard to their cancers at all. Even though your endometrium and your cervix are part of your total uterus, they develop into totally different cancers. So we'll be exploring this in more detail in subsequent videos. Okay, so that, that should suffice in framing your thinking for this unit on cervical cancer. You now have a bit of an idea as to how it differs or mimics endometrial uterine cancer, and we'll be building on this from here on out. If you'd like a copy of the chart, you can find it via the link in the description box, or you can go to menopausetaylor.me where you'll find all my charts. I'm the chart queen. 
Next week, I'll teach you about the risk factors for cervical cancer, and you won't want to miss that one. If you need me to help you with anything personally, all you have to do is go to menopausetaylor.me and schedule a consultation. If you want to follow me, all you have to do is go to Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, or Instagram. And if you want to subscribe, you can do that right here by clicking subscribe, and you can also subscribe to my newsletter. Okay, bye for now! Ha, 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 ha.